Good morning. How did you like that? I'm, I, I need to give John a hard time because he caught the biggest fish. And that's not supposed to happen. Could you have seen yourself doing that 10 years ago? Five years ago? Yeah. I should be asking Christy. <laughs> Could you see your brother doing that? That's the kind of stuff God does. There's a, there's a verse. I want to say it's 2 Corinthians, but that just means it's probably in 1 Corinthians. If there first be a willing mind... It's accepted according to what we have, not what we don't have. And we think we don't have a lot of stuff in us that God knows is in there. And if we make ourselves available, if we make ourselves willing, he'll do the rest. So thank you. And, and I think that kind of stuff is important because in our values, we have a clear statement. We believe every member of Prescott is a minister. And we believe that God talks to all of us, not just some of us that are called pastor. And so, well done. Thank you. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles. Uh, the first place we're going to be is John chapter 1. But while you're getting there, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, first of all, I, I don't know who adorned our auditorium with such a beautiful tapestry but but whoever that person was thank you it it's it it has absolutely improved the neighborhood secondly um we had peeps on thursday we signed up about uh, i think we're up to 23 kids that have paperwork submitted already we're not planning to launch our after school program till after labor day september 7th um but we are going to have an organizational meeting on the 14th which is basically next sunday where we can go over the changes from last year and the different things we're going to do this year and so uh if you're interested in being a part of the after school program during the 11 o'clock hour next week we're having a meeting uh, also, if you check your bulletin, a number of people have expressed interest in becoming a member. So we're planning a class uh, that starts September 11th, the, the first Sunday after Labor Day, thinking Labor Day is kind of going to be a, a hitch in the, in, in the process. And so rather than start and then delay because of Labor Day, we'll just start that class on the 11th. It generally runs three or four weeks, depending on how many questions are asked and how much discussion takes place. And uh, if, if you have any interest in, in considering Prescott as your church home, I'd encourage you to take it. And then one last announcement on um, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, we will be hosting a memorial service for Ron Stump. We got word last Sunday that he had gone to be with the Lord. He lost his battle with cancer and he's got family in from Michigan and they're leaving on Wednesday. And so we didn't have a lot of time to work with. And so we met with them on Friday and they really were hoping we could have a service tomorrow. And so we are at 11 o'clock and you're all invited. There'll be a luncheon to follow at Skewers. Um, I'm not even sure where that is, but it's it's somewhere here in California. And and then the family will go to the gravesite for a private interment. But you're all welcome to the memorial service at 11. Without further ado, let's get into the scriptures. If you were with us last week, we began a new series where we're focused on the idea of living like Jesus. And if you think about it, when Jesus was on earth, living amongst us, just uh, taking on human flesh and becoming just a part uh, uh, of the world of humanity, we got a glimpse of what living like Jesus was like. In fact, in John 1, we read, the Word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. He made His dwelling amongst us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, 
this thing is not going to cooperate this morning. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. Jesus has given us a chance to know what God is like, to understand his heart, to understand his mind, and he's given us a chance to be like him. And if you remember, Scripture is also very clear that the, that the real core idea of Christianity, the very essence of Christianity, is that we would live like Jesus. 1 John chapter 2, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. Paul, writing to the Colossians, says, whatever you do, whether it's word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so we launched into this series where we're focused on living like Jesus. And we're doing so because of the sad reality, and we pointed it out last week, the sad reality is that modern Christianity seems to have lost that concept of Christ-likeness. And I believe that is a huge, huge problem. In fact, if you look at statistics, one of the things that um, is very alarming about uh, the United States and America, but, but the world at, at large, is since the 1950s, Christianity has been in a free fall as far as the Western world is concerned. Now, other places in the world, what we call the third world or the majority world, uh, God is doing amazing things, and Christianity is actually in the uptick in many of these places. But if we look at the Western world, Christianity has been in free fall. And there's a lot of people that look into that kind of stuff, spiritual leaders who are concerned and, and, and they do research and studies. They try to figure out, well, why is this happening? And I don't know that we can say there's any one reason. But a lot of them come to the conclusion that the more Christianity loses sight of the fact that we are to live like Jesus, the more that decline tends to. Is it still? You got me? Okay, I'm back. Um, when, when, when these scholars look at this, and, and they've come to this conclusion that this, this loss of focus on Christ-likeness is part of the problem, in my mind, that just kind of makes sense in, in this way. If you think of people outside of the church, I'll call them outsiders, why in the world would an outsider join a community that claims to offer things like transformation and new life, but somehow fails to deliver it. It, it wouldn't make any sense that, that I would want to join that. And, and yet these scholars uh, uh, who, who study this decline have come to the conclusion that many, many Christians in, in churches today, instead of focusing on Christ-likeness, they have settled what they've called pseudo-transformation. And the idea is something like this. We know, because Scripture teaches us, that we as Christ followers ought to be different. Now, when you look at the difference through the lens of Scripture, that difference is supposed to be in our hearts. It's supposed to be in our minds, and it then makes its way out into our conversations and our behaviors and our, and our relationships. It's an inside-out transformation. But, so, but suppose your heart's not being changed. You may settle for some superficial uh, substitutes to demonstrate that difference. 
And that's kind of going to be our focus this morning. I want to spend some time talking about what in the world is true spirituality. And and to help us answer that question, we're actually going to start with a negative. We're going to start with what true spirituality is not. And we begin our, our journey in Matthew 23. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Now remember, this, this idea of pseudo-spirituality uh, uh, or, or, or pseudo-transformation is, is based in the idea we know we are to be different. And we know that difference is supposed to start in our hearts and minds. We know it's an inside-out transformation. But if that's not happening within us, and it, it, it becomes very easy to settle for some kind of substitute which, as, as we read this text, is exactly what the Pharisees were doing. No one, no one uh, having read the Gospels, would come to the conclusion the Pharisees' heart and Jesus' heart were, were one in the same. We'd never come to that conclusion, would we? No. But yet, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law sat in Moses' seat. They knew what the Bible said. They could tell you what the Bible says. The problem wasn't their knowledge. The problem was they did not live up to what they had learned. And so one of the uh, potential superficial ways that we rely on to demonstrate that we are spiritual might be uh, labeled biblical academics. The idea being the more Bible knowledge, the more theological knowledge we amass and, and, and we learn, the more spiritual we become. And it, it makes sense to a certain extent. We expect Christians to attend church. We ex expect them to be a part of Bible study. We expect them to spend time reading their Bibles and other Christian literature. And the conclusion is, well, when you're doing all of that, how can you not grow? It just kind of makes sense, right? If you go to the gym and you do a bunch of exercises, you're going to get more physically fit. Your muscles are going to grow. And we take that same mentality into our understanding of spirituality. So if you're, if you're doing those kinds of, 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 of spiritual exercises, you must grow. But then we have the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were experts in biblical history, in Jewish theology, in the interpretation and application of the law. They were the leading theologians of their day. The problem wasn't their knowledge. The problem was their lack of living up to what they had learned. It's very much in sync with a fellow by the name of John Maxwell. Years ago, coined this saying, and it stuck with me ever since I heard it the first time, the average Christian is educated way beyond their level of obedience. Now, Knowing and learning is very, very important. I say it all the time. You cannot do what you do not know. But knowledge in and of itself is not the equivalent of spiritual maturity. The Bible calls us to be doers of the word, not just hearers, not just knowers. So, so biblical academics, well, that's a poor substitute. And, and all of these will be somewhat similar. Another poor substitute for genuine spirituality is when we consider the spiritual disciplines. Uh, the spiritual disciplines are very important parts of our relationship with God and the process of spiritual growth. They include things like prayer, meditation, worship, 
serving God in, in different ministry capacities, Bible study, things like fasting and giving and living a simplistic life, depending on uh, who you're talking to. Some people say there's seven spiritual disciplines. Some people say there's nine. I, I, I don't know that that kind of stuff matters. They're very, very important as far as the process of becoming more and more like Christ. But what we have to understand is practicing the disciplines is, is like being on a path. Just because I get on Highway 99, and I know if I go north on Highway 99, I'll eventually get to Sacramento, getting on Highway 99 doesn't mean I'm in Sacramento. That's a pathway to Sacramento. Do you understand? It's a means to an end. It is not the end in and of itself. And again, the Pharisees are the perfect example. When Jesus talked about them, he talked about how they would go out into the public square and they would practice certain things like prayer, not to commune with God, but to be seen. So that people would look at them and say, oh my goodness, look at that guy. He is so spiritual. He is so close with God. Look at him. He's out there on the corner and he's praying. And the reality was their hearts, as we know, were far from God. How do we know that? Because when Jesus came and stood right in front of them, they did not recognize him as the long-promised Messiah. They completely missed the boat, despite the fact that they were the leading theologians. If anyone on the planet should have recognized who Jesus was, it was them. But their hearts were out of sync with God, and so they completely missed the boat. And so biblical academics, well, that's a poor substitute. So are the practicing of the spiritual disciplines. If, if we get that check-the-box mentality and we see the mentality as being, well, because I do these things, I must be spiritual. No. Another possible uh, uh, pseudo-spirituality uh, hiding place I'm, I'm calling it self-righteousness because it looks an awful lot like self-righteousness, although that's not the best label, because I don't know any of us would say, I am self-righteous, that means I'm spiritual. But, but the gist of this is self-righteousness, and here's what I'm thinking. We know where to be different. And so what do we do? If, if we're concerned about being different, we work at it. We attend church, we are in Bible studies, we're involved in different ministries, we practice biblical stewardship, we believe the right kind of things, we stand up for the truth as we know it to be. And then we look around. And when we look around, we begin to notice, oh my goodness, Carol's not working near as hard as I am. Carol, shame on you. We begin to notice there are people all around us who aren't taking Christianity nearly as seriously as we are. And they're not working nearly as hard as we are. And as soon as we start doing that, two very bad things begin to occur. And I think they're very revealing in that they demonstrate we're really not as spiritual as we may think. As we start to notice that other people in our estimation are not working as hard as it, at, at, at their faith as we are, and immediately we begin looking down on them. And at the same time, we begin to feel superior. And in case you didn't realize it, we are becoming like the Pharisee that Jesus talked about who went up into the temple to pray when there happened to be a big old sinner in there. And the big old sinner stood off on the side 
He didn't feel worthy to be there. He wouldn't look up to heaven. He looked down in shame. He smote upon his breast, and his prayer was simple, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. But that wasn't the Pharisee. The Pharisee walked in, he took the most prominent position in the temple, and, and he prayed, God, I thank you I'm not like that sinner over there. And then he started to recite his resume of all the wonderful things he did for God. And in case God missed the point, his idea was, God, you sure are lucky to have me on your side because I'm one of the good guys. Look at all the stuff. I'm, you would be lost without me. Do you remember what Jesus said about those two guys? Who went home righteous? the sinner, not the Pharisee. Because having that kind of sense of self-righteousness, feeling morally superior and looking down on others is not a sign of spiritual maturity. That is not how Jesus acted. One last thing I, I think we need to talk about, and, and again, a lot of overlap here, but externalism. Here we focus on outward behaviors that make them the litmus test for godliness. And often when we do this, we ignore deeper, more important issues of the heart. And I've talked about this before. To some extent, that's the kind of church where I became a Christian. Now, I didn't realize it at first, but but I became a Christian in 1975. And so it probably took a couple years for me to figure this out. But there, there really did come a point in my life, and, and I didn't say this out loud, but I jokingly said it in my mind as I looked around and observed what was happening in the church. I, and I thought to myself, you know what? You could beat your wife and be a member in good standing here as long as you carried a King James Bible and went on visitation. And I know that's a bit of an exaggeration. But you know what's sad? It's only a small exaggeration. Everything was measured by externals. And matters of the heart were often completely overlooked, completely ignored. It's as if they did not matter at all. The only thing that mattered was the externals. And that directly contradicts the teaching of Jesus. In Matthew 23, verse 23, it's a continuation of where we started, where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. One of the condemnations he had of the Pharisees was the simple fact that they tithe from their herb gardens. He said, you pay tithes of mint, anise, and cumin, but you've omitted the weightier matters of the law, things like justice, mercy, and faith. Unless we get the wrong impression, he said, now, now you should have tithed. That's a good thing. But what you shouldn't have done is in your tithing, forget about the important stuff, things like justice, mercy, and faith. These ought you have to have done, but you should not have left these things undone. And so when we look to answer the question, what is true spirituality? We have to understand, biblical academics is important. Spiritual disciplines is important. Trying to live up to some kind of standard of righteousness is important. And, and a lot of external things are important, but none of them do an adequate job of defining what true spirituality really is. And so I want to spend the rest of our time Focusing on the positive now, well, if, if, if they don't summarize, if, if, if they don't do an adequate job of defining true spirituality, what does? Starting in 1 John 2, verse 6, whoever claims to live in him or in Jesus must live 
as Jesus lived. Now, here we have a very clear and a very simple understanding of Christianity. But it, but it does raise a question. What in the world does it mean to walk as or live like Jesus? I think it means to live as if Jesus was in your place. We talked about this last week. I think it means to live in a way that I, in fact, am not living. Jesus is living through me. And that presents a very real challenge. It's going to require us to pursue a very intimate relationship with Jesus on a very personal level. And I say that for this reason. We live in a very different time, and we live with very different circumstances than Jesus. And I know it's real simplistic to say, well, what would Jesus say? What would Jesus do? In any given set of circumstances, we've all done that. When we are doing the how to how to deal with your adult kids, the subject of an invitation to a same-sex wedding came up. Well, what would Jesus say? What would Jesus do? And any biblical teacher who is honest will say this to you. We don't know, we don't have that example in scripture. I can tell you what I think Jesus would do, and you can tell me what you think Jesus would do, but what we don't have is a clear picture from Scripture because Jesus never got invited to a same-sex wedding. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now think about our lives. Well, what would Jesus do if a guy cut him off going 80 miles an hour down the highway? I don't know because Jesus never went 80 miles an hour down the highway. So I can make it up and tell you that, but I'd be making it up and tell you that. Which means I'm usurping the role of God in your life. Because the last time I checked, God did not appoint me to be God. And, and, and this kind of stuff gets me worked up. Because again, I'll, I'll go back to the, the church where I became a Christian was real good at telling you what God said when God didn't say it, they were saying it. And that's why I say we have to get a very personal, very intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. So as we live our lives and we live in the real world where all these complex situations will come up, and I do, I, mean, I love the idea of what would Jesus say, what would Jesus do? Because we don't know, I have to draw close to God because I'm thinking every single one of these situations. In fact, I've been asked that same sex wedding questions all the time. And I said, I, I, I don't think going or not going is the answer. I think communicating is the answer. I want to look this person in the eye and say, I will attend your wedding because I love you and I want, you know, God's best for you. What I don't want you to do is misunderstand. I, I, I don't approve of same-sex marriage. And so I'm communicating. Or, I love you. I want God's best for you. I can't go. Let me explain why. Whether you go or not, to me, is not the issue. It's how you go or not go that is the issue. Communicating is the issue in my mind. And, and I want to be able to, to, to take every circumstance that I might encounter that is, has no, uh, uh, no uh, specific issue where Jesus did this or Jesus did that, and, and I've got to figure it out. I want to be so close to Jesus to make that easy. So I can, I can have a sense that, yeah, this is where Jesus would be and what he would say and what he would do. And then just to add another layer of complexity, because it's not just 
we, we live in a different time in different circumstances, all of us will are different. So we're not just going to be different as far as history is concerned. We're going to be different from each other. We all have different personalities. Is it wrong to be an introvert? Is it wrong to be an extrovert? Is it wrong to be passive? Is it wrong to be assertive? No, those are not right wrong issues. They are, they're distinct personality types. But yet, there, there's things I would say that my wife would never say in a hundred years. There's things I would do she would never do. I, I call it, she gets the deer in the headlights kind of reaction. The, the one that sticks in my mind is we, we were buying a car. This is probably 15 years ago. And, and you know how they work you. You talk to the salesperson, you make the deal, then you go in the back office and they bring the office manager and he wants to open renegotiations. And, and so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, the deal's done. I'm going to buy the car. And the guy starts renegotiating. I say, honey, we're going to leave now. And she's looking at me like, what do you mean? I said, we're leaving now. And then the guy starts looking at me. What do you mean you're leaving? I said, I just talked to your sales representative. I just made the deal. If, if you want to sell me the car, guess what? All that paperwork I filled out has all my contact information. I'm not going to sit around here and waste my time. I'm going home. You, if you want to sell me the car, call me up. I'll come in and buy it. If you don't want to sell me the car, sell it to somebody else. I'll buy a car somewhere else. And with that, I got up and left. And my wife was horrified. She shouldn't have married me. <laughs> That's me. I got better things to do than talk to cars. I don't like buying cars in the first place. They, it, it, it's like going to the dentist. It's a painful, necessary experience. And she's looking at me like, oh, what did I get myself into? She would never do that. I find that as easy as getting out of bed in the morning. <laughs> we're all different. We have different passions. We have different interests. We have different abilities. We face different circumstances. And some people have great advantage and some people have severe obstacles. And you add all of that difference together. And you know what? How Carol lives Christ's likeness in, in her life, even though she's not working as hard in her spirituality as I am. Her Christ likeness is going to look and sound a lot differently than mine. Why? Because we're two different people. And that's okay. We need to live like Jesus, which means we have to really get to know him. Another way of conceptualizing this is doing things in Jesus' name. And I want to start with the scope that, that Paul lays out here. Whatever you do, whether it's something you're saying, whether it's something you're doing, do it all. In other words, he's not talking about a narrow segment of our life that we would lump into the religious or the spiritual compartment of our life. He's talking about the entirety of our lives. Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. He's talking about our entire lives. Everywhere we go, everything we do, everything we think, everything we say, all of it should be done in Jesus' name. And the idea there is do it in a way that is consistent with his character. Do it in a way that Jesus himself would do it if he were physically present. It really isn't any different from what we just talked about, living like Jesus or walking like Jesus. It's just Paul says it by, by doing it in Jesus' name, and John said, live like Jesus. But they're virtually saying the same thing. And what that means is every moment of our life 
is an opportunity to be more like Jesus. Saturdays often I do yard work. I don't like yard work. But you know what yard work is? It's an opportunity to live like Jesus. I, I need to do my yard work like Jesus would do yard work. If I'm putzing around in the garage or I have a workshop, I need to do that sort of thing in a Jesus-like way. When I answer the phone or I'm talking on the phone, I need to do that like Jesus. When I'm visiting with family or friends or neighbors, when I'm out enjoying hobbies, when I'm, when I'm on the job, whatever we do, wherever we go, whether it's something we're about to say or something we're about to do, we should do it all in the name of Jesus. And that means we're talking about whole life spirituality. One of the, the misconceptions last week, we talked about George Barna, uh, who's like a Christian researcher and Gallup. I don't, I don't know if Gallup has a first name, but, but he's more of a secular researcher. Uh, and, and they do surveys and research, and sometimes they overlap. And one of the things they found is an awful lot of people think God lives inside of church buildings. Now, we know that's not true. But despite the fact that we know that's not true, we often don't realize that God is everywhere all the time. So when I'm out and about in, in, in the real world where, where life happens, I often don't realize that God is right there with me. I know it in my head. I just don't act like I know it. Because we often compartmentalize God. God is only involved in and a part of those segments of my life that I deem to be religious and spiritual. And so when I come to church, God's a part of that. And if I'm at a Bible study, God's a part of that. When I'm over here doing something else that's not connected, then God is, he's, he's taking a nap somewhere. And what we're talking about here in, in, in this context is, instead of compartmentalizing God, let him have all of us and all of our lives. I can count on one hand all the times I've quoted Dr. Martin Luther King, but I'm going to do that this morning. This is taken from a speech that he gave at Barrett Junior High in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, back in 1967. And he's talking to junior hires. He says, when you discover what you will be in your life, set out to do it as if God Almighty called you at this particular moment in history to do it. Don't just set out to do a good job. Set out to do such a good job that the living, the dead, and the unborn could not do it better. If it falls on your lot to be a street sweeper, sweep streets like Michelangelo painted pictures. Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Leotin Price sings before the Metropolitan Opera. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who swept his job well. If you can't be a pine at the top of the hill, be a shrub in the valley. Be the best little shrub on the side of the hill. Be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be a sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or fail. Be the best wherever you are. And I would suggest to you, when we are living in Jesus' name and we are living as Jesus lived, that's exactly what we will be. When we start looking at our entire lives and say, this conversation with my neighbor is an opportunity for me to be like Jesus. And this job that I'm undertaking with these people observing or these people partnering as a part of a team is an opportunity to be like Jesus. Let's not confine God to the spiritual and religious compartments of our life. Let's unleash him 
to be a part of our entire life. Let me mention one last thing. One last criteria, if you will, it's found in Matthew 12, or excuse me, Mark 12. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. We have many differences and we face unique circumstances. And so as we said earlier, Christ-likeness is going to look differently and sound differently from person to person. But that doesn't mean there isn't a common denominator. And that common denominator is right here. When we talk about what is true spirituality, the real issue is, am I becoming more loving of God and the people around me? That is the standard that we must measure ourselves against. And it's not just a standard that Jesus taught. It's a standard that he lived. I know that because the Bible tells me, though he was equal to God, he humbled himself and became a human being and subordinated himself to God's will to come to earth and be our Savior. And the reason he did this was love. He loved every one of us. What's probably more remarkable, he loves us warts and all. And we see it in his life. I often ask people, because we think of love as a one-size-fits-all, and it's usually kind of soft and mushy and, 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 and that sort of thing. Jesus loved everyone, right? And we read, we read some of the things he said about the Pharisees. That tells me he loved the Pharisees so much he was willing to tell them the truth, despite how he knew they would react looks very different than how he talked to the woman at the well or how he talked to the woman taken in adultery. Love is not a one-size-fits-all. Sometimes the challenge of love is telling a loved one the truth that they don't want to hear, but they desperately need to hear. And Jesus was willing to do that. But there was a tender side to his love. He, we, we, we have a gospels that are, that are filled with stories of loving the sick and the lame and the blind and the leper that no one would go near. We know he loved the tax, or the outcasts, the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the immoral. He even loved his enemies at the cross. He prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. So regardless of anything else, we need to recognize when I, in my walk with God, begin to love God more and love my neighbors more, what is actually happening is I am becoming more and more like Jesus. Now let me try to wrap this up for the day with kind of a hypothetical. What in the world would happen if Christians actually started to live like Jesus? If we traded in pseudo-spirituality for genuine Christ-likeness, what would happen? Do you think how Christianity is perceived in the world would change? Because I sure do. Do you think the kind of influence Christianity exerts in the world would begin to change? Because again, I sure think that would happen. In fact, I think that would happen to such an extent that I believe the world, and particularly my world, would become a much better place. And if you believe that, I would challenge you to never settle for anything less than authentic Christianity, Christ-likeness. And I know that that may seem like a drop of water in an ocean of need. But, but the simple reality, and I, I don't know when I began to think this way, is but a long time ago, I realized, you know what? I don't have any control over the body of Christ. Nobody gave me a magic wand. I could wave my magic wand and fix the entire body of Christ. I don't have any control 
over, over all those different people that are part of the body of Christ. But there is somebody I have absolute 100% control of, and that's me. And when I start doing a better job of controlling me, so that I start living like Jesus, and I start living in Jesus' name, here's what I know. The world around me will begin to change. I say it all the time. If I go to Carol with my hand out like I want to shake, she's going to respond to me with friendship and shaking hands. And if I come at Carol like this, she's going to put her dukes up and defend herself. People respond to how we present ourselves. And if we present ourselves as, as Christ-like, as living in Jesus' name, and, and, and living in a way that Jesus is actually living through us, the world around us will begin to change. So never settle for anything less than true spirituality and Christ-likeness. Can we pray together? Father, thank you. This is an important challenge. We claim to be followers of Jesus. We often don't do a real good job of following. The whole idea of what it means to be a Christian is based in the idea that Christians were like Christ. We need more Christ-likeness. We need more people living as Jesus lived, living in Jesus' name. There's a lot of things that we do as Christians that are important. The real essence of our faith is going out in the world and living as Jesus lived. So, Father, help us not to get tanged up, tangled up in all of the externals, in all of the disciplines, in all of the learning. All of those things are important as long as they are promoting the goal and, and a part of a process where the outcome and the result is, we are becoming more and more and more and more like Jesus. May that be so in each of our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.